minutes left. Good morning. I'm Sean Gold. I'm an executive director of product definition and applications engineering at Maxim. A few years ago, uh, our friends at Google um, came to us and asked us to develop a direct 48 volt to CPU and memory solution um, for their, their next generation of um, racks and servers. Uh, the key elements of that product were that it needed to have um, as good or better, preferably better efficiency end to end from 48 volt to core as a 48 volt to 12 to core. It had to be modular, it had to be scalable, it had to support all of the required interfaces for the processors that Google was using. Um, it had to support memory, and uh, it had a couple of other features that I'm not allowed to talk about. So that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Um, yeah. So why did, why did Google do this? Um, they started out with a, a very long history with 12 volt, um, with 12 volt servers. And they're starting to notice that with the improvements in um, CPU capability and uh, the power requirements that there were getting to be larger and larger distribution losses, it was causing um, power density issues in the server. But there were three really very important, um, important reasons. Um, they took a look at their energy bill. And uh, today, um, about 2% of global energy usage um, is going to powering data centers. If you look at that in, in real terms, um, the energy consumed by that 2% that is about the same as the energy consumed by Italy, especially when they're making pizzas and so on. Um, so U.S. data centers are forecasted to consume 140 billion kilowatt hours in energy by 2020. That's a huge, huge number. Um, and rack power really is one of the greatest um, OPEX um, line items for, for everybody powering a data center. So these are all critical, critical items for developing a new technology. And of those, um, on a server, the CPU and the memory are the, really the two dominant loads. So for this first project, that's really where we, we focused. We wanted to develop one product that could be um, used and scaled throughout the, the motherboard to accommodate CPU and memory. So this was a brand new architecture. Uh, Google introduced the 48 volt rack um, publicly um, back in 2016 at OCP, but they've been working on it for, for quite a while. Um, and this did in fact require um, new regulator architectures, and that's, that's really what I'm gonna be talking about for, for today. So um, specialized CPUs for AI, machine learning, big data, autonomous cars, cloud computing, um, Internet of Things. Um, these are all elements that are driving up the density of the CPUs. Um, it's driving up um, the number of um, uh, cores on a particular CPU, uh, the power dissipation, the operating frequency, all the elements that are contributing to higher power density in the rack. So um, right now the, um, the power density is approaching 20 kilowatts, um, probably in the next um, two to three years, and that's gonna have a big impact on the economics of, of making this solution work. So we're really looking at a very different and challenging architecture for going um, direct from uh, the, the 48 volt bus um, direct to the core. So um, this eliminates a conversion step. Um, Again, it needs to be scalable because there's lots of different varieties of these CPUs, GPUs, and memories, FPGAs, and so on. The efficiency had to be very high. Um, I believe that Shin mentioned that the minimum efficiency um, needed to be greater than 93%. Um, our product is, is better than that. Um, and it had to be cost effective. So in the rack, um, with this new 48 volt rack design, just in terms of the rack, um, we need to get better than 20% uh, uh, conversion losses. The, uh, just the distribution losses through the bus bar, um, we can use um, a much more efficient bus bar and then it's roughly one fourth the current, which translates to one sixteenth of the I squared R distribution losses. So um, 
The characteristics of our, our solution are a very, very fast transient response to meet all the requirements for Intel, um, AMD, um, FPGA, um, NVIDIA GPUs, and so on. Um, has to be very high efficiency and flexible to accommodate all of these needs. So I'm going to go over a very uh, quick overview of Maxim's technology that's enabled this new solution, and then I'll present the, the um, high-level details of the product itself. So Maxim has been in uh, the power business um, since the company was founded, and we have um, really three very important enabling technologies um, for this solution. We have monolithic integration of very, very high-quality power MOSFETs with the control system. Um, we have developed some optimized packaging, and these are, uh, for this design, the power stages are all um, flip chip in QFN with very, very low um, uh, DC resistance from the silicon to the outside world. And then we've been using integrated magnetics. And that's a little bit of an interesting term because you know, some people will think that integrated magnetics is we're integrating the, the magnetic core and the silicon. What we mean really is that we're combining magnetic elements on one core. So in the, the case of this, um, this figure here, we're showing a um, four-phase coupled inductor. Um, for the technology I'll be presenting, we're, we are combining a transformer and coupled inductor on one core. So um, we're really leveraging Maxim's uh, very long experience in, in power design here. We've, uh, We've been in the CPU core and, and memory power delivery business um, for really for more than 12 years. Uh, we have an existing base of design wins and uh, we've engaged with all the major customers in this space and we're applying that experience to this product. Um, we're leveraging what we learned from uh, the 12 volt products and really this is helping us to um, reduce the risk and reduce the total cost of ownership for this new product. So let's get into some of the specific details. So I mentioned that um, this is a, um, a direct CPU core, um, a direct uh, conversion from 48 to, to CPU core. Um, this is a variant on a product that we've been using for a very long time. Um, it's a variant on a quick PWM supply. And we're using a primary side H bridge to drive this combined transformer and coupled inductor. We have a very efficient monolithic power stage that's controlled with a secondary side controller. Original design for um, this system required isolation. It's really just an option. And we have a fast digital isolator that allows um, the PWM control signals to pass the isolation barrier really within less than 15 nanoseconds. So the transient response is extremely fast. Um, and then we have some capability for recovering some of the switching energy um, from the secondary um, and using it elsewhere in the system. So uh, the quick PWM architecture is a, a multi-phase architecture, which means that we can take um, up to four of these transformer coupled inductor um, power stage elements and phase synchronize them to deliver power. So with this controller that I'm presenting today, we can control up to um, four of these, these units, and uh, we can turn them on and off at will. We can go into discontinuous mode for very good low current efficiency. The efficiency curve is very flat. Um, and uh, again, the, the control scheme um, relies on uh, the, the measurement of the output voltage and current to very high accuracy and um, translating those elements into quick PWM uh, to PWM signals that are used to drive the full bridge. So with this approach, we can accommodate input voltages from 40 to 60 volts, and that is necessary um, given this new rack architecture design that's using a, uh, a battery um, pretty much in parallel, ba backup battery in parallel with the, um, with the input voltage. So nominal voltage, um, as mentioned earlier, um, is around 54 volts, and um, when the battery kicks in, you can see a span from 40 to 60, and uh, for that reason, we've chosen a transformer turns ratio of about 6 to 1. 
that puts a switching voltage on the secondary um, of around 10 volts, which is a, a, a good voltage to operate a secondary side low voltage power stage. Um, the secondary uh, controller, again, can um, accommodate up to four of, of these devices. And uh, I think I've covered um, all of the other details in, um, in my earlier discussion. So go on to the next slide. So um, with this approach, we do achieve scalability and flexibility. So if you, um, you know, have a 125 watt design, you might use two or three transformers. If you have 165 watt or higher, you might use four. Um, we can scale the design of the transformers and, and uh, uh, accommodate a little bit higher current than that. Um, this approach does not require any significant tuning or um, uh, compensation variation with the, uh, with the use of, uh, of a different transformer. So we, we have multiple magnetics options for different form factors. Uh, we can either optimize efficiency versus board area, height versus um, a footprint, and so on. Um, and uh, this product does, in fact, meet all of the Intel um, specifications for their qualification spreadsheet. Yeah. So the next few slides cover actual regulator performance. So I'm, I'm showing the overall load line uh, at 1.8 volts out, and the, um, the solid um, red and green lines are the, uh, the upper and lower margin limits, and we're well inside of that for transient max and min. Okay. Um, this is the transient response for a 10 amp to 200 amp to 10 amp load transient on both edges. Um, I've got a couple of slides coming up that are showing the this kind of performance with varying the load frequency. Go ahead. So um, these slides are kind of interesting. I mentioned that this, this product has the ability to do automated phase shedding, which is also part of um, the Intel requirements. And you see some jagged edges as um, we, we transition on the load step there for a lower frequency load. And what you're seeing there um, is the, the controller automatically dropping phases um, from, uh, or tr transformer sections from four to two to one. And uh, you're saying, well, there's a little bit of overshoot there. It turns out that in, in this particular case, we are not exceeding the transient max and min um, for the, the response requirements. So this is perfectly okay. When we start to increase the frequency of the load, um, the time response for automated phase shedding um, is controlled. So if you get faster and faster loads, the automated phase shedding does not necessarily kick in and you get a nice clean transient response. So this is a dynamic VID transition from 1.5 to 1.8 at 10 amps. And again, we're meeting the requirements there. So Maxim provides end-to-end um, -end design support for these products. And by that, I mean um, we have um, simplest and spice models um, for this product. Um, we provide you with a complete reference design, and we can provide end-to-end -end support um, for the PC board layout. Um, from you know, concept to Gerber out, we have a, a very large team of applications engineers that can help with the layout and make sure uh, the component selections across the whole board are, are, uh, are done properly. So we have full uh, design and verification support. This is a photo of our wind tunnel at, at headquarters. Um, so for a particular design, we can run it um, at full temperature and um, uh, airflow rate. Um, we can do the full characterization and thermal evaluation um, in our lab. We provide a GUI with this product. Um, this is the splash screen for all of the SVID parameters. Um, we have um, similar screens for the PM bus interface. And uh, finally, we've got uh, um, uh, telemetry uh, uh, mapping and so on for uh, taking data over time and, and, uh, and graphing it out. 
So um, this, uh, this particular application um, can support multiple um, CPU, memory, GPU on the same board. You can have, um, uh, I think, up to the, actually, the PM bus limit for the number of devices on the bus. Yeah. So there is a, a total cost of ownership advantage to this approach. I'm not going to go through it in, uh, in complete detail, but we made a couple of assumptions. And we figured that the server lifetime was about four years. Um, and operation is 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And we made a baseline assumption of about um, 10 cents per kilowatt hour. And today, um, we're getting an approximate um, advantage of about 2% um, in the efficiency of the regulator. Um, we expect that that to improve by 2019 to about 3% just with the um, product improvements that we have in our roadmap. Um, CPU power today is roughly, um, we did a baseline estimate of 2 times 100 watts going up to 2 times 160 watts in 2019. Memory power has got a commensurate in interface uh, uh, increase, excuse me. Um, and uh, that gives us a total power increase um, really um, from around 400 watts to 800 watts. And then there's um, an, the number of, of servers per rack is going up from 20 to 25. And that gives a total rack power increase from 8 kilowatts up to 20 kilowatts with an overall uh, data center power utilization effectiveness of 1.1 today dropping to 1.05 tomorrow. So these are really the, the ground rules for this, this calculation. And so what we did is we looked at you know, going from 80 to, uh, 8 to 20. Um, we computed the lifetime savings per server and then the total payback required. Um, there is a typo on this page. The, la the lifetime savings per server is actually um, uh, $7. That the bottom line there is correct that the, for 100,000 servers, the total savings is around $700,000. Um, when we get our um, improvement due to the distribution loss um, uh, reduction in uh, uh, 2019, that number improves dramatically um, to around $12 million. Um, savings in total cost of ownership. So with this approach, um, in 2019, we're getting a, a payback return on investment in about 1.1 years. Okay. So um, to sum up, um, 40 volt, 48 volt rack architecture really is, is driving this movement in um, compute density. Um, New applications, um, higher power CPUs, GPUs, accelerators, FPGAs are driving racks from the 8 to 10 kilowatt level today, going to 25, 20 to 25 kilowatts tomorrow. Our solution employs over two decades of 12 volt server experience, and we're, we're taking all of that know how and putting it into this new approach that passes all the requirements for Intel. Um, supports all the necessary CPUs and GPU and memory, and is really providing a best-in-class efficiency. Yeah. Go. Okay. Any questions? Hey, yo. Thanks a lot. Oh, that's hot. Um, from a um, from the, the TCO standpoint, so that, that's predicated on CPU side of things. Do you see similar or, or even better performance out of kind of GPU applications where you start talking about higher capacities? I would say yes. Um, what we've seen for GPU load performance is they, they tend to be um, less dynamic. They tend to sit in one spot in the efficiency curve. And, uh, and while there are load transients, they don't occur as frequently. They tend to be more, much more even usage. So we have the ability to optimize for a, a narrower operating point. And so you just get better, better, better peak efficiency because you're not having to deal with the variability of the load steps. I think what we're doing is we might be compromising the peak for the efficiency where the dwell time at a particular operating point is, is highest. 
So we, you know, we can optimize either on um, the, the magnetics design or the you know, usage of, of uh, output capacitors and so on. But we are, we are engaged with really all of the major CPU and GPU manufacturers to um, deploy the solution. Oh, Thank you, uh, Brian Johnson of Power Rocks. So, um, yeah, kind of also in regard to your, your payback calculation, um, and, and I can see some of your assumptions, you know, making sense, especially for a hyperscale solution. Um, but the, you know, the majority uh, of data set implementations globally are going to be those small, um, mid-size, you know, medium-size enterprise uh, implementations, and you know, and they're going to have PUEs that are closer to two. Mm -hmm. um, and so, with that in mind, and then also maybe a, a little bit of recovery, you're going to, uh, excuse me, a little bit of efficiency gain you'll recover from incremental improvements in, in front-end uh, overall efficiency. My question is, how does your analysis and TCO payback period apply to the majority of global implementers that are not hyperscale solutions with near unity PUEs? That's a really difficult question. I know. I, um, <laughs> I, I think the best way to, to really address that is to um, get the, the real numbers and cost um, for the smaller implementations and just run the numbers. Um, if, you, if you want to pursue this in a little bit more detail, I'd, I'd be happy to engage with you after the, uh, the talk and, and really go through the numbers. There's a lot of assumptions that we're making here. Okay. We've got time for one more. Yeah. Does this support ABS bus and what switching frequency Excellent question. Um, the solution that I presented today um, does not support the inter AVS bus because the controller was developed specifically for Intel and PMBUS. We have an AVS controller in development today. Um, we should see first silicon on that controller later this summer. Oh, um, switching frequencies are programmable for this. And again, we can optimize um, uh, efficiency over uh, magnetic size so we can um, Switching frequencies are programmable from 300 kilohertz up to about 540 kilohertz. And we found some, uh, and that's per core. So you get a very high effective interleaved total switching frequency for, for the design. And as such, the output impedance is very, very low. Uh, the AVS bus implementation that we're working on is um, going to be fully compliant with the AVS bus specs with a bus bandwidth of um, up to 50 megahertz. Okay. Any, any last ones? Okay. Th thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thanks a lot.